Spoon of consciousness. Let's raise our frequency. Welcome to the Spoon of Consciousness podcast. My guest today is Lucy and I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, my name is Lucy Cavendish and I'm an author and a creator of Oracle decks and books full of words that hopefully take you on magical journeys. Thanks so much for having me here tonight. Thank you so much for joining me, Lucy. I really appreciate you accepting the invitation. And um, I came across your channel and uh, on YouTube and I was just fascinated. Um, for everyone who hasn't come across your books yet, could you tell us a little bit about what you write about? Yeah. Um, wow. What do I write? I guess what I do is I try to explore mysticism from the point of view of, yeah, I, I guess ancient witchcraft essentially, but bringing it into a modern era and attempting to sort of explore it in a way that is not dogmatic and not um, prohibitive for lots of people. Um, and, and really the books are a product of everything I get obsessed with myself. Um, and I'm a very obsessive kind of person. I, um, I tend to get into these grooves where I just want to immerse myself in worlds and places and information and, I, you know, I've always been like that. I'm quite intense in some respects. And so the books are really a result of me delving into these places and spaces that I really want to go and that I'd like to take other people to as well. Um, so, look, I, I'm really fascinated by what seems to be ancient, but which is still incredibly relevant, um, I feel, to our lives today. So, yeah, that's a really broad container. <laughs> that's <laughs> perfect. That's, that's kind of what I do. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, okay, this is the the thing that I'm interested in, right? What is mysticism? Like, there, I've heard people being ah. called mystics. I've heard other people saying you need to like talk to this mystic, and that. I'm like, what what is the the general gist of it? Well, I guess anything. A mystic is someone who explores mysteries. And there's so much that's unknown. So I think scientists could be mystics as well because they're exploring the unknown. I think a mystic truly is someone who explores the mystery and who doesn't necessarily try and solve it. Maybe that's the difference with science because science tries to develop uh, laws and um, that can be tested again and again and pr be proved right. I think people who are mystics are perhaps exploring the mysteries in a very experiential kind of way to sort of see what happens uh, to their own consciousness or to their own body or life um, while they're exploring them. And I think that they're the kind of people who step what I would call between the worlds. They're kind of here <laughs> and they're kind of not here mm -hmm. at the same time. So they've got a foot in this world, a foot in what we might broadly call the other world. And they're kind of a bridge. Some mystics bring stuff back for others to explore and some don't. Some just go there <laughs> and kind of stay there sometimes. I'm, I'm pretty grounded. So I'm definitely, <laughs> you know, I've definitely got one foot there and, and one really solid foot. Um, in this world because I think it has so much to offer us and so many mysteries to offer us. So that's kind of my, yeah, that's kind of my take, I suppose, mm -hmm. on mystics. It's a great question. I haven't actually asked myself that. I'm going I'm to ponder that for a long time now. Yeah, I think it's a, definitely a question worth asking any, like everyone because I think a lot of people have different perspectives on what their interpretation is. But um, one thing that you said that has sparked my interest again is um, having one foot in this world and one in the next, or even being completely in one or the other. Like, we are having this human experience. We're beings that are trapped in the flesh, so to speak, but we've got access to the other realms. Like, how important is it? I know, I think I know the answer already, but like, how important is it to keep ourselves here instead of just being out there or like just having our focus outside? Well, look, I'll, I'll go back to that idea of being, you know, a spirit trapped within a body, for example, just to start with, because I tend to think of 
the body or the physical experience as an expression of the spirit. So it is the way spirit materializes and is expressed through physical form. So it's not that the spirit is within us and it's trapped in this kind of cage. I know sometimes people feel that way, but I wonder whether that's because that's a very, uh, it's almost become spiritual dogma in a way. And my feeling is that in fact, the physical is a materialization of spirit as it's spoken through the flesh and articulation perhaps might be a way to put it. Mm. And Therefore, <laughs> therefore, being here and being embodied and being alive and being connected to the natural world, what we might very broadly call the natural world, is, I think, inseparable from having a kind of mystical experience or a spiritual life. I know that for many people, there's this idea of, you know, it's quite an ascetic kind of process where you take yourself away from the physical life as much as possible in order to immerse yourself in spirit. For me, I feel really strongly about immersing myself in the natural life, in the physical life, whatever, however that kind of comes through at the time. Obviously, you're not always going to be in the peak of health, but I think it always has something to teach you, to deliver to you. And yes, it's impermanent, but that in itself is a part of the lesson. So I, I kind of feel that the physical is the way you, that your spirit chose to speak. Mm this lifetime so it's really important and and therefore being what people broadly call grounded i think is really important really important and i think it saves us from becoming a, a different kind of egocentric kind of person you know like a spiritually egocentric person who's like wow i'm so enlightened i don't even need my body <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, that's cool. But if you knew how many spirits were like lining up to get into planet Earth right now, <laughs> you'd you might appreciate it a wee bit more. So, yeah, again, that that's kind of my take on it. I'm really but glad. Yeah. yeah, I'm really, I'm really glad you clarified the spiritual dogma sense of like being trapped in the body. I think like that's a a belief uh, belief system kind of thing that's been expressed to a lot of people, but. I'm really like your perspective on that is quite interesting though and the way you say like there are some people who think or maybe they act in the way that they are so enlightened they don't need the body and they don't need worldly things like they you know it stems from I don't know where it's coming from but it seems to me as though it's becoming like a um a way for us to look down at others if they're not as spiritual and that like I've seen that coming about a little bit in in our community as well something that you mentioned that really um got me interested is um there's spirits lining up to be here and is that to say that like is that to say that there's only a certain number of spirits or physical expressions of spirit that can be here Oh, no, I, I, I don't. T the truth is I don't know. I don't know. Um, but that's, that's not so much what I meant. I, I guess I, what I feel is that there is, you know, I don't feel like there's a great big queue, you know, of people taking tickets and going, yep, yeah, next, <laughs> next step off the bus is, is planet Earth and I get to be a human. Um, I guess what I mean is that there is, I believe there are other ways to, experience life and, and to be a life form you know there's so many different ways and there's so many that are beyond our ken right now because they're I believe interplanetary and they're galactic and I feel that there are dimensional beings or beings from other places who do want to have the experience of physicality that we're blessed with um, here and I just don't feel that it's um, something to be taken for granted because I think there really are beings who are kind of thinking, you know, how, how quite often people will say to me, all I want to do is be energy. 
And then I kind of feel from my connections with those beings who are pure energy that they're kind of like, yeah, but being physical <laughs> would be so cool. So <laughs> I know I'm putting that in a, in a very kind of unspiritual <laughs> way, but I really do feel that there's something, I guess the kind of spirituality that I have embraced throughout this lifetime is one that is immersed in sensuality and by sensuality I don't just mean typical sensuality I mean being of the senses being alive to all of your senses and to really appreciate that and to love that something you said before that was so interesting was this idea of people who feel that in order to be spiritual they no longer have any worldly needs and I think there's a difference between someone who no longer has any worldly needs as in they're no longer entrapped perhaps by um, consumerism or wanting to buy their way into spirituality or enlightenment. There's a huge difference between that person and a person who denies um, the flesh because even those who no longer have any need of materialism still need the world. They still need air. <laughs> they still need this connection to the elements and that's the difference. I, I totally agree that in order to explore a spiritual path, there needs to be a space in which you no longer have a craving for consumerism, mm. essentially. Because that is kind of a, it's a religious path, you know, for many people. It, it really, really is. Yeah. You're, and this, this idea of like transcend, I always call it transcending the BS, like, um, it, it's either like the traffic or the uh, th whatever it is that is trapping you in thinking that that owns your life, whether it's, you know, wanting to buy designer stuff or uh, maybe it's drug habit, maybe it's food addiction. Like I've had these things in my past. And yeah. when we transcend the BS, like you can really realize that you, it doesn't own you and you can still enjoy certain things without it having that dominance over your life. Um, and I think this comes to what you were saying about the senses, like uh, some, a quote that I really like, I forget who it is, but they said, I think it was um, Ralph Smart. He was saying, um, you've got to lose the mind and come to your senses. And I really like that because it's, it's like so important for grounding, right? Like during meditations, you can pay attention to what you're hearing, how things smell, how it sounds and things like that for me has been a huge lesson. But um, I'm just wondering, like, for, for my own benefit and, and for the other, others listening, is there, any, <laughs> is there any way that you've seen that we can really tune into the senses really effectively, like, to help to tune out everything else that's distracting? Yeah, I, I, I believe I have. And my way of doing it is immersion within an element. Um, so for example, um, my go-to place is the ocean. And if I can get in the water and if I can catch a wave, if I can be in that space, it's changing all the time. The light changes, the temperature changes, the wind, you know, lifts and falls. You're right in that experiential space. You go under the water and you hear things differently, feel things differently. And to me, that's as close to heaven as I get, um, you know, and you can't really think in that space in the same way. You can, you can still work with your mind and experience but it's very much an instinctual kind of place like you you your mind isn't shut down but it suddenly comes into a relationship with your senses so they're kind of interweaving and interacting like dive under this wave no don't dive under that wave you're about to get smashed you know all of the, all of those things are going on within your brain but they're supporting the experience and I, I've sat out there sometimes and I've just watched the light move behind clouds and I've just felt like turning around to everybody and going, look, <laughs> you know, look, look where we are. That's, that's a go-to place for me. To me, I think uh, I've kind of moved more into kind of moving meditations or Ones where I'm no longer still, um, not so much because stillness is challenging. I actually 
can be very lazy and, and like to be still. <laughs> but I like to have this sense of getting deeper into my body and say, for example, through a strenuous kind of yoga practice where I'm really feeling, you know, I'm feeling my cells. And through that, somehow, my mind begins to quiet. It's not so much that it, that it goes. It doesn't go, but it, it calms. It calms down and it stops feeding me back fearful information <laughs> that it quite likes to deliver to me. And it look, my mind's cool or your ego can be quite cool because it's attempting, I believe, to keep you safe most of the time in it, in, within its understanding of what is indeed safe. And I think, unfortunately, we listen to it so much that it's turning us into kind of almost domesticated human beings and we're losing a little of our wildness and that's what I really like to bring back. Yeah, I love that idea, Lucy. And, you know, um, okay, this is coming again from that side of, like, I should do this to be spiritual. Like, the idea, of, I'm, I've got a very short attention span and I've got a lot of energy and I love to move and I like to always be doing stuff. So meditation sitting down for me is really really hard so um I'm, I'm a lot better at it than i used to be but this idea of movement meditation is so much more attractive to me like i always keep stuff like this around where, wherever I, this is just an orange but like wherever wherever i am i need to have something bright and shiny in front of me not necessarily like expensive but just something colorful to keep my attention like here otherwise my mind just travels like yeah yeah, mm. it's, it's to pull your consciousness sort of back into a focal point. And I think that's where, like, if you, if you can pick something up and you can touch it and feel it, something about coming back to the senses stills the mind from its <laughs> great wanderings. And sometimes those wanderings are fantastic. Sometimes they're wonderful. But I think you need an anchor. I kind of talk about it in terms of being an anchor. And I kind of feel like you need a touchstone. And to me, the mandarin that you've just held up is... Or, or the orange is, is a touchstone. It's something that reminds you to come back, to come back to yourself and just to still and chill mm, for a yeah. moment. And then I think everything comes back into relationship with itself. Otherwise, we could all just go <laughs> and not come back for a long time. And, you know, I'm quite, I always sort of say I'm, I'm pretty interested in driving my car safely and, you know, not kind of going too much because I can get quite trancy behind the wheel, for example. I have to kind of remind myself to reconnect with my body so that I don't vague out while I'm in those sort of sketchy situations. I need to come back and be firmly within myself. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm really glad you said that because now I feel comfortable sharing my own story with that. Like when I drive, I feel like that's my some of my best thinking time, but then I always think like, well, I should my attention should be on the damn road, not what's going on in here. But I feel like I have sometimes I have my best creative thoughts while doing something as mundane as driving or washing the dishes or you know those kinds of things. Speaking my language. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I I'm, I'm in accord with what you're saying. I, I, I actually really relish doing things like folding laundry <laughs> and, um, you know, doing quite what other people might think are really like, you know, that's so not spiritual or that's taking me away from my spiritual world. I kind of crave that stuff sometimes because what it does is it chills my body out, chills my mind out. I'm doing something quite repetitive in a way. And then part of me kind of goes on this little journey while that's taking place. But I'm anchored enough in, in the physical so that I don't just vanish or so that I wake up three hours later in a daze, you know, with, I don't know, my soup upended on me. <laughs> I just think it keeps you, kind of keeps you real. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's back to that thing of, you know, chop wood, carry water. You know, I, I really feel it's essential to do the very ordinary things in our lives and that doing those ordinary things does not make us unspiritual or unspecial. It kind of keeps us grounded, keeps things real, keeps us connected. And for me, I, I really love them. 
I really, really love them. Some of them I don't love so much. <laughs> Some of them I can live without. I, yeah, I definitely agree. I think um, in my own journey, so like I work in an office sometimes and um, when I'm sitting there, I used to hate it with a passion. Like I used, it used to drive me nuts. And then I reduced the time that I was working there and I still go back and forth. But when I'm there now, I see it as this is time for me to settle into something that's not very demanding of my mind but that gives me the freedom to have those creative thoughts and to like if I think if we're always creating or if we're always trying to be spiritual and we don't come back to those mundane things this out of whack like it's out of balance um and we can fit like I don't know I'm not speaking for everyone but myself like I was really into one side or the other and I was like, no, I don't want to have a job. I don't want to use money. I don't want to have this. I don't want to use clothes. And and then I was thinking to myself, well, I need to eat. Uh, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to go to another country one day. I need money for that. Like, I'd li- I would like to think I'm a strong swimmer, but I don't see myself swimming all the way to Australia. Those kinds of things. Like, yeah. it it's, it's a necessity, but it's also like a thing of balance, which I've learned recently is is really helpful. Yeah, yeah. Look, while while you were speaking, I was focused on what you were saying, but I was just thinking about that that sense of making the most of wherever you are. So if you're in a job that you're really not <laughs> you're not loving, I think there are ways of working with it. What I used to do when I was a lot younger was I'd cut, you know, I'd I'd, I'd have this moment of I, I I can no longer work here. I must be free. You know, my spirit must be free. I, don't, I can't be a, you know, I can't be part of the herd. More, I must leave, and I. I believe, and then within weeks I'd be going, but I have no money <laughs> and, I, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And duh. and so I'd panic and I'd re-enter this very same space that I'd, that I'd kind of leave in many ways. And so I had this real, it was when I was in my 20s, a real to and fro, to and fro between the two, whereas now I'm much more like, I kind of, I, I don't work in those sorts of spaces anymore, but it took me a long time to build the bridge to get to the other part where I could do what I really wanted to do all the time. Mm. Yeah, yeah I, I really, you know, okay, so this is a concept that um, I have a, I've gotten into a lot of shit for, for excuse, like, I, I don't know what a better phrase for it is. I get a lot of shit because I have spoken about we are not just here to pay the the bills, give the tax money, and then die. Like, there's a lot more to it than that, and I think everyone in the spiritual community definitely agrees. But when I say that, uh, the, the stuff that I've come into resistance with is saying, well, how am I supposed to leave this current situation and move all the way to doing what I love? And I said, it's not that. It's not just you click your fingers and you do it. Do you, do you think, like, like I'm just wondering for myself like because this is the way I see it like we need to have what we're doing right now and build what we're doing what we'd like to do until we can earn from it or until it can support our lifestyle yes on a pragmatic level yes and on another level I think it's really individual sometimes what happens for people is things come and get them. You know, sometimes in life what will happen is something will come and get you and almost pull you out of where you are somehow through your life circumstances. And for some people, you know, in some of the work that I teach, I I call it the oracular break with reality (laughs) or, or the commonly agreed upon reality. So what tends to happen is for some people it can be an illness for some people it can be a loss you know a a devastating loss within their life either of another person or a home or a job sometimes what happens is your purpose or spirit in some kind of form comes and gets you and takes you out of there but on the other hand if that's not actually taking place for you and you're kind of cruising through your job and thinking this cannot be all it is well it's not all it is but for example, you know, I had I had two decks out and published with Hay House and I was still working a full-time job at that stage because I was taking care, you know, I was taking care of my little one. I was, you know, I was doing all the things you got to do. And it took me a long time to build that bridge to get completely to the other side. And there was something about having a job as well that I felt kept me real as well because, I, you know, I know people. 
I know people. I don't just know spiritual people. I know people, mm. all kinds of different people. And I think it's really important to know people and know what it's like to be in that world so you can bring something back to them that's relevant. You know, because if I hadn't known all of those jobs that sometimes I'd cry, you know, I'd pick up the phone to my mother and I'd sob. <laughs> and I'd be like, I hate my job and I hate my life and this can't be all there is. And oh. I think now, thank goodness I had all of those and I know what it's like to experience that because I know, I know what it's like. I know, I know what it's like. And I, th I hope that what I offer relates to that. It just doesn't relate to you if you can be a pure being or a pure spiritual being. It's for people who, the work that I do is for people who are in jobs and they're not sure what they're doing there or they're in relationships and they don't know why they're there and they're hurting. You know, it's, it's for imperfect people in imperfect lives wanting to create a richer and more meaningful experience. Mm. And sometimes to have that, we, we do need to get brave. You're, I, you're speaking my language, man. And I, and I really think that there's a... So another thing that I really love that has been said over the years, um, I think it's Alec, uh, Alexis Crow or something like that. He says, suffering is de essential in the development of man because he is both the marble and the sculptor. And like our suffering, we can choose how we want it to shape us, right? Like that whole, everything you said about being able to bring something back, like I think that gets a, a little bit lost it, with a lot of people who are finding out about spiritual things, like finding out about the truth and things like that. They're like, oh, that's the way it is. Okay, well, I don't wanna have anything to do with the real world and they just reject it completely. And I think it's really important for us to, to remember that we're all imperfect. Like none of us are, are sitting on top of the mountain in a Zen position, just existing and that's it. Like we, we all have something to offer and we're all working on something. Um, like common misconception that I've seen with people who are spiritual teachers, people think that they're perfect, like they can never do wrong and that you know, they are completely in touch with the divine uh, at all times. And, and I think that's, that's something that prevents us from moving forward with our own spiritual practice. Um, have, you, have you seen that in your own journey? Yeah, I, I feel that one of the aspects of more modern spirituality that I encourage people to think about, I can't say that it's wrong, it may not be wrong for them, but I encourage people to contemplate um, what they're actually saying when they say this. You know, quite often I hear people saying, I want to be a pure channel for spirit or I want to be a conduit for spirit. And this sense of being only near a channel, a conduit, rather than a human being who brings to the work life experience there's a sense of wanting to push all of that out of the way, to push all of your life experience, all of the beauty of being a human being out of the way and just being a pipe. And I kind of, I, I feel that, you know, with, without being disrespectful to people who describe themselves as channels, I think that you can't divorce yourself from the fact that your flesh and blood, that your spirit articulated through this form, and therefore part of what you do is flavoured and coloured by that. And that includes every single stuff up you've made <laughs> in your life. You cannot love yourself and hate the experiences that have made you yourself. You need to start, I guess, if you're going to truly love yourself, you can't just love this idealised version of yourself, you know, because we all touch the bliss, you know, we all have those ecstatic moments where everything's beautiful and perfect and we are connected to the divine or whatever the divine is for us. But we move in and out of degrees of that experience. We ebb and flow. Mm -hmm. And if you think that you've got to stay in that heightened place 24-7, in order to have anything of value in the world. I, I don't think that's true. I think there's so much beauty in our ordinary lives and I'd love people to embrace that and to see the beauty in their humanity.
Lucy, you're definitely hitting on something that I am very I've been thinking about a lot, especially lately. One thing that I would like to ask your opinion on is like, what do you think it is about people that makes them want to reject their humanity or the things that make them human? Maybe it's their past experiences and then embrace this idea of I just want to be channel for spirit or I just want to be a being of energy. I think because life is very challenging, I think it's because the truth is life is quite difficult mm. and there are parts of our lives that are really challenging, really challenging. Dealing with our, much as I celebrate physicality, dealing with the pain that that can sometimes bring for, for some people, I think that's very, very challenging. Mm. I think the emotional landscape that we're all navigating is just stitched up with with social landmines that we're always treading on and it hurts it hurts and because of that i think it's very seductive to somehow feel when you touch the bliss you know when you have that heightened moment to think it could be like this all the time <laughs> and then we, we we kind of run we run from ourselves. And I do think, you know, it, it sounds a little bit like I'm just celebrating the way life is. I'm not really because I think we are in, in many ways seduced and entrapped by all sorts of social, you know, there's a kind of conditioning out there and a kind of experience that, that we're likely to have depending on the culture we're in. And I think a lot of those are quite painful. And if you experience pain, it's, it's really natural to not want to hurt. It's really natural. But I think the trick is, like you were saying before, is to let the pain sculpt you in a meaningful way, to make something out of a painful experience meaningful. And even those moments of nihilism can have beauty to them as well, depending on how you make sense of it and depending on where the destructive force lies because there are destructive forces within us and outside of us and we need destruction within our lives sometimes to renew ourselves, to change and so forth. So I, I think it's not just about all about your attitude because that's very mind-oriented. It's, it's all about even when we're in, in pain, sometimes remembering that it's temporary and that you'll find a way to make meaning out of it. You know, and sometimes I really struggle with that. It's like, <laughs> how can this be meaningful? This is, you know, I, I guess there's that sense of life not being fair quite often. And when you're, you're, you're up against that, you can really struggle with that. But I do feel that whatever the circumstances, broadly speaking, there is a way of creating meaning out of the suffering that is inherent to being a human, so, as well as the bliss. Mm. But with that being said, okay, so like my view on creating a meaning out of the suffering for me is what like I've just put belief things together that have made it work and make sense to me and then I just use it to whatever way I want it. Part of that has been that this idea of, okay, stuff has happened, you didn't want it to, it was really messed up, and it hurt, and it you know broke you or whatever, um, and you try and find meaning in it, but it's really difficult, and it's hard, and you can't really seem to do it. And then someone came along and introduced me to the idea that we contracted to have every single experience that we've had before we came here with the people that we're around. So we decided to have the family, the friends, the bad relationships, the good relationships. We decided to have all of it before we came here so that our soul could learn from the experience or the spirit could learn from the experience. And for me, that provides a certain level of the meaning. But then again, my skeptic mind is always saying, well, oh, that's a bit of a convenient excuse, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of with you, skeptic. Um, <laughs> um, look, I feel... And this is where I'm at now. And who knows where I'm going to end up as I grow older and have different experiences and contemplate this more and have different life experiences. My feeling is that 
we have a kind of fate or a kind of contract that we come in with a theme a story that our lives are likely to tell but within that within that story there are choices that we can make in every plot point of the story that will have a huge impact of how the next chapter unfolds. So part of it I feel is written and part of it needs to be unwritten in order for it to be a learning experience. Because otherwise all you're doing is a conscious part of yourself, your soul, is sending in the unconscious part of yourself to go and do stuff that the conscious part already knows. <laughs> it's a bit mean <laughs> and um, it's like well, you, you didn't really do very well on that one until you get to my my perf perfect understanding of things you have to go back and experience it again my you know there's some old um, traditions in the Nordic path for example and there's a, a philosophy called word w-y-r-d and it's this idea of a web that we're constantly interacting with and we're part of the web we can't we're not separate to it we don't arrive within it we're actually a living stitched in part of a web but every vibration that everyone else makes upon a cord of that web affects us but it's our response that weaves the next part it, it's really hard to describe exactly the other thing that i kind of or philosophy that I get a lot of nourishment from is a Celtic one, which is called Geish. And it's been interpreted many times as the curse that you come into your life with, <laughs> which sounds really negative, but I kind of see it more as the theme you come into your life with or the pro prohibitions or the boundaries that you are going to come up against and struggle with in your life. And until you come to some kind of peaceful understanding with that, that geish or that taboo or that curse, you will struggle more than is necessary, more than is necessary. And it's a spiral. It's not a straight line. You're not just working your way in this sort of hierarchical way from one level of consciousness to another. You're consistently spiraling in and out of a, a deep place, bringing the wisdom back into an outer place then going back into that center again. So moving in and out all the time. So I, I, I really do feel that yes, there are people who we have uncanny connections to and people who we meet who we really shouldn't have met. You know, everything lines up it, and it's perfect and beautiful and somehow you've magnetised, but it's just not you magnetising that person into your life because it's your story or it's your um, contract. There has to be an element, I believe, of free will within it so that you can keep some kind of creative process to being alive. Because if it's all predestined, you're not, how are you learning anything is what I struggle with a little bit. Definitely. Maybe I'm not wise enough to get that one. <laughs> Well, I think there, I definitely agree. I think there has to be a certain amount of free will, creativity, leeway for us to actually have a fulfilling experience here. Like, I really, really like the idea of the web because it really makes sense for me. It's up to us how we respond to that incoming vibration, whether we want to put the same or something different or go in an entirely different direction. Um, you know, we... We've spoken about some things that have cleared up my understanding of, of certain spiritual concepts. So thank you so much for sharing everything with us today, Lucy. Um, I just would like to know, um, you know, we're coming to the end of our discussion and I'd just like to know, like, what, what's next for you? Like, what are you aspiring to do with the time that you've got on the planet? Ooh, you know, that's, that I think about it a lot. I think about it, you know, my, my father's in the last stages of his life this time around, and it's made me really look at mortality in a very real way. When you're really up against it, it really makes you consider, I have this time here, I have this precious time here, I don't know how long I've got, what am I going to do with it? And so for me, I'm going to try to write the books that I want to write most. 
I'm going to compromise less about things that I really care about. I'm going to spend more time with the people who I love and who love me. I'm going to be in nature more and more and I'm going to immerse myself in the possibilities of spiritual travel. And by, by that I don't mean meditating at every site I go to, but going to places that have fascinated me and drawn me in. Um, I want to spend... I want to spend time creating relationships where people know that they're really loved and where I feel like I gave other people the opportunity to really love me <laughs> as well because I put, I put my time, mm. you know, to them. And, you know, it's that simple. You know, it's that simple. I want to spend as much time with, um, you know, my mum and my dad um, as possible, my brother. I want to spend as much time, you know, with with my husband and with my close friends. And I want to really, I want to love the shit out of my life. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. I really love your answer to that yeah. question because I think it applies for everyone, right? Like everything you just said, I would love to do that too. I want to make the rest of this experience worth living and worth you know, when you go out of here, you're just like, well, you know, I lived the shit out of it. It's cool. I'm, I'm all right with, yeah. with leaving now. Um, and I think that is something extremely I wanna, valuable. I want to give it a really red hot go. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, I think for many of us, we hold ourselves back, you know, like we're kind of bridled a lot of the time and, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But when it gets to the point where we're actually, we do have more freedom and we do have enough in many ways than to deny ourselves the experiences that our soul longs for i think i don't know i just don't i don't want to do that i want to live i want to i want to love i want to i want to surf i want to write i want to pat my dogs and you know i want to maybe learn to ride a motorbike <laughs> And just, I don't know, I just want to, I want to be, oh, and I want to, I want to grow more things. I want to plant more trees and I want to, um, I want to know more about trees and plants and flowers and all those good things too. I want to grow more of my own food. That's a really big thing uh, for me in the future. That thing about growing stuff, like, I, I know I keep looking at this, but like, whenever I think about growing That's some... <laughs> It, right look like this started as the one of the seeds that's inside here and it's literally like over well how i don't even know how long it takes to grow it but like it, the seed flourishes into a tree and then the tree produces the the flower and then the flower produces the fruit and it's like then the evolution of life and i whenever i think about it i think well that's going to happen to me like i may one day uh, flower some children and they will produce fruits and and like you know then it'll be my time to return into the soil and for the next gen and like it I think there's something so grounding about observing nature and in particularly like when we're growing it um, I don't know if this is actually real but when I've done it in the past like I feel like I'm embodying a similar vibration because I'm around that growth like it's keeping me present and and keeps me allows me to transcend the bs a lot more <laughs> i look i feel that growing food or growing plants or helping them grow is one of them it, it's it's really nourishing you know on a metaphorical and, and as well as a literal level but one of the aspects of it as well is I think it's really empowering because for many of us there's this idea of we have to buy everything we have to buy everything and we buy our food we buy this we buy that we buy our power and in a way when you start to grow something even if you grow something really really that first moment you actually eat something that you that you helped grow that you witnessed come you know out of the seed into the shoot into the plant into the flower into the fruit when you eat that fruit or drink that tea from that herb you i i think you've reconnected with the life cycle in a way that's empowering and you're also saying 
I am an interactor <laughs> in life. I don't have to purchase everything. I can buy it with my time. I can earn it with my energy. I can create it with my attention and my love. And I think if we all got back to that sense of my time is really valuable and I could spend my time doing this, then we would feel really joyous more of the time. And I, I do believe that feeling joy and feeling ecstasy and bliss is a big part of the possibility of this existence. And too many people are missing out on it because they kind of feel enslaved in one way or the other. Mm. People would say to me, oh, it's all right for you. You know, you're, you know, you're just, you know, you're just writing whatever you want to write. But it took me a long time to get to that place. And as I grow older, you know, I'm, in some ways I'm really aware that, you know, I'm paddling in in my life. I'm not paddling out. <laughs> you know, I'm on the paddle in. And I want to make it count. I want to, I want to just really be immersed in this beautiful life. And I want to keep things simple. Not simplistic necessarily, but I want to keep things simple. I don't want to get caught up with um, sophisticated. <sighs> I don't want to make an idol of sophisticated spiritual thinking. I want to live <laughs> and I want other people to enjoy their lives too. Yeah. I've, I've really enjoyed speaking with you today, Lucy. And, and this has been such a uh, enlightening experience for me to speak with you about some things that, um, I'll be honest with you, have, have really got me like in that thinking, contemplative mode for about so many things. But yeah, this, this discussion has really cleared up my understanding on a lot of things. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. Oh, no, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you and to speak with everyone out there. I, I very much appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Cool. So, like, um, yeah, we're, we're at the end of our show now. And I'd just like to ask, like, where's the best place for us to get a hold of you if we've got questions or if we want to check out some of your books? Sure. Um, probably the best place if you want to ask me questions is Facebook. Um, I have a Facebook page and, you know, I'm not there all the time, but I, I do interact with people. Probably best to leave a message on the wall. I'm really cool with that because people are probably asking the same question. I have no problem with that at all. Go ahead, you know, plaster my wall with your questions. And the other place is my website, which is www.lucycavendish.com.au and you can send me a message there. And I'll do my very best to get back to people and to help out however I can. Cool. Uh, for everyone who's watching and listening, all of Lucy's links will be in the description and uh, on the screen if you want to check those out. I highly recommend you check out our YouTube channel as well. It is fascinating and there's so much good information for you there. Um, thanks again, Lucy, for joining us and thank you everyone for tuning in. Remember, you can catch us every Wednesday and Saturday. And if you're listening on iTunes, please leave a review. It'll really help the channel out. And if you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. You know you want to. <laughs> and we'll see you on the next podcast. Peace. Mm -hmm.